point where the only reason we will be receptive to anything else is in order to be more productive. Like we're pre pretty much convinced that productivity is the name of the game. It's what we're paid for, it's what we're employed for, and so forth. But really, productivity without receptivity is a waste of time. Um, we, so to listen and to be open to and to enjoy um, things that are not necessarily your own uh, area of productivity is absolutely essential. And I think there are many circles at our school where that operates. And it's always been my dream that these center forums are a place for not just one person's productivity, but for a circle of people's receptivity um, in its own self, for its own sake, actually. Because I think that's where it's at. So thank you for coming and doing this. Um, uh, Tara is not someone I know well, or maybe hardly at all, actually. Um, so I'm going to, especially to, for her, uh, read what I now know. Uh, Tara Dudley, PhD, is a lecturer here. Uh, she teaches interior design history one and two, American architecture, mm -hmm. in a new course uh, called Afri the African American Experience in Architecture. Her research focuses on 19th and early 20th century architecture and design. She uses archival resources and oral history. She's uh, used this approach to study, especially in New Orleans, the Jean de Couleur Libre, the free people of color, their influence on the growth of New Orleans, and their implications of their contributions to the New Orleans built environment. Dr. Dudley's dissertation is being reviewed for publication. She is also writing a biography of John Saunders Chase, who was the first African American to enroll and graduate from uh, UT. She's worked uh, as a historic preservation consultant for 15 years, uh, completing varied preservation and cultural resource management projects, doing recording, historic, furnish historic furnishings, historic landscape reports, interpretation, national register nominations, and historic context. She got her graduate degree of uh, history and a master's degree in preservation from here, but she holds a bachelor's degree in art history from Princeton. So here's to learning more about Tara and this wonderful subject. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Um, in thinking about what I was going to talk about today, I, I had a little bit of difficulty just because my areas of interest um, cover lots of territory. I mean, we could be here all semester, really. Um, and so really what I've done today is kind of coalesce my own research interests, um, things that I've done recently, particularly um, in my African American experience course that I taught last semester for the first time, which was pretty awesome. And then, um, you know, thinking about today and when I got the date, oh, it's Valentine's Day. It's like, who's going to show up for Valentine's Day? So thank you guys for coming and showing me love. And I hope that you guys love um, the, the talk today, uh, which is, you know, just kind of really very informal. Um, but in thinking about today, I, I like music and Once Upon a Time maybe might have been a singer. I don't know. Um, and so just the song that kept coming to mind, of course, when I was looking up, you know, to make sure I had the year right of the song. It kept giving me um, the Black Eyed Peas, Where Is The Love? And I was like, no, that's not the one I want. Because um, I'm old school, as my children say. I like to listen to um, old school music. Um, and so the, the song that you were listening to is Where Is The Love by um, Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway. Um, and thinking about that year, 1972, you know, and how, how are we making this relevant? Well, 1972, of course, was the year of a president election, um, presidential election, which we are engaging in. But that year, we also had the first black female um, candidate, Shirley Chisholm, who was running for president. Um, black electoral politics took a major step forward in 1972 with representatives Andrew Young and Barbara, Barbara Jordan, um, who I hope most of you, most of you know, um, being that we are in Texas. Um, and they were the first African Americans to win seats um, in the House. Um, in business, we have an African American who was elected to the board of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and Maya Angelou, uh, the famed poet, of course, uh, premiered the motion picture Georgia, Georgia, 
um, that year, and she was the first um, African American woman to do so. Um, the image that I have up is of Vincent Matthews and Wayne Collette, who were on the um, U.S. Olympics track and field um, team that year. And of course, uh, 1972 is mostly remembered, um, as far as the Olympics are concerned, for the Munich massacre uh, that happened that year with the, um, the, the kidnapping and murder of members of the um, Israeli Olympic team. Um, but that year also saw sort of a, a, a secondary protest. Um, everybody knows the protest, I think, um, in 1968, where the, um, the silver and gold medalists of the 400 meters uh, raised their fists um, with the black uh, power protest. Um, but the following Olympics, we have a similar um, silent protest that's kind of been forgotten by Matthews and Colette, um, who um, won standing on the podium receiving their silver and gold medals. Um, just they didn't salute the American uh, flag or, or stand at attention, I should say, uh, during the national anthem. Um, and so this is just, you know, a little bit of context for 1972 and where my brain was going um, in thinking about this lecture. And of course, February is Black History Month. Um, so I thought that focusing on these areas of interest would be um, relevant. Um, in 1972, speaking specifically of architecture, Though that's the year that the, the towers of the World Trade Center, um, designed by Minoru Yamasaki, were completed in New York City. Another project by Yamasaki, of course, being Pruitt Igo Housing Complex, was uh, <coughs> demolished over various phases in 1972 as well. And um, in my approach to architecture, I, I, or coming upon architectural history and teaching um, and consulting as a career, um, you know, growing up as a young African-American woman from the American South, um, it's not something I would have thought about pursuing. Um, and I didn't really know about much architecture um, in, a, in a formal fashion, of course. Um, I didn't know any architects per se. Um, in high school, I wanted to be an interior designer because um, I was familiar with sort of that kind of work um, in, in decorating and, and how one treats their domestic environments because I was really involved in 4-H. Um, and so those kinds of projects. Um, but once I, you know, it's time to go to college, determine a, a course of study. I studied art history um, and pursuing a career as an architectural historian is something that would never have um, crossed my mind. Uh, but via art history and working in um, house museums, you know, as opposed to something like Pruitt Igo, and you hear about sort of these negative impacts that happen um, and all the, the negativity uh, that happen in architecture, it, it's related to African Americans typically. Uh, one of the issues most prevalent today, of course, being gentrification of African American communities that we're dealing here with um, in Austin and in most American um, cities. And so, um, you know, just learning about the built environment was uh, very different for me and, and my sort of um, access to knowledge was, was very different. Um, and so how I learned was through art history and beginning to work in um, historic house museums. Um, as an art historian um, with <coughs> my undergrad, I didn't want to be a curator um, in a museum and so I um, embarked on sort of a, a very interesting trajectory um, in between a graduate, um, or I'm sorry, a, a, post-graduation from Princeton internship at the Met, um, I came back home to Louisiana um, and, and had an internship at Shadows on the Tesh, which is an 1836 um, antebellum Greek revival house that you see in the background here um, that was um, built in New Iberia. It's like 20 minutes outside of my hometown. I had never actually visited there growing up, but was able to um, have this internship uh, they had historic furnishings reports, and so one of the projects uh, that I specifically engaged in was um, redoing the summer dress. Um, so in the South, of course, uh, you know, the open windows and doors for ventilation, very specific arrangement of the fenestration in this house as many a plantation home in the American South. And so you throw open your doors for cross ventilation and breezes, but that brings in dust and mosquitoes. And so people would cover their furnishings with slip covers, mosquito netting over beds and, and lighting fixtures and so on and so forth. So that's what you see here in the background um, in my younger days. So we're putting up the mosquito bar on one of the four poster beds um, in this interior space. Um, but previous to this, um, you know, in Louisiana, there are plantation houses everywhere and the knowledge of them. And so that's probably one of the earliest sort of um, 
the access I had to architecture and knowledge about uh, buildings in particular. Uh, and as a sixth grader, actually visiting, um, doing essentially the pilgrimage in Natchez, Mississippi, of the various antebellum homes there, um, a very personal and kind of funny connection. And, you know, and it's just interesting. And you think about African American architecture and history, the first thing people usually think about is slavery and, and plantation homes. Um, and being really ingrained in that in the American South. But um, visiting Stanton Hall specifically, um, most of you probably won't know what I'm talking about. There are probably very few people at this table. But in 1985, there was a TV miniseries called North and South um, that was on, and Patrick Swayze was one of the main characters. <laughs> at that time, my mother, as many other mothers, were, of course, in love with Patrick Swayze. And so the interiors of um, Stanton Hall were used for many of the domestic scenes of the fam the house that the family, and I can't remember what the family um, name in the movie was, but so all of my little friends, you know, they want to know, well, which room was Patrick Swayze's, you know, kind of thing. And so nobody wanted to ask, of course, and then I got voted somehow to ask the question. And so, you know, and it's, I remember this scene very sort of surreal. Um, in a surreal way, so there are the velvet ropes in front of the doors because you can't go in the rooms, you can't touch anything, which is impossible for you know 10 and 11 year olds at the time anyway. My dad was chaperoning, so I had to be on my best behavior anyways. And so I walk up to the curator, and by that time everybody's looking at me, what's she doing, what's she gonna say? It's like, ma'am, can you tell me which room was Patrick Swayze's? And his name was Rory, that was his name in the movie, so which room was Rory's? <laughs> I mean, she looks at me and she's like, oh my goodness, and I was just like, oh God, what did I do, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And she's like, no one has ever asked that before, which was kind of surprising to me. Follow me, and I was just like, oh God, because everybody's looking at me and my dad's like, but, like, oh no, you know, and so she goes and, you know, just kind of very, like in a dream, like almost, and she pulls back the rope and she's like, go in, and I was like, what? And she's <laughs> like, go in, and then she tells me, would you, or ask me, would you like to sit on the bed? And so it's this high four poster bed that you need the bed steps to get on and there was this like white coverlet and I was just like, oh my God. And so somewhere either in a box or maybe lost, there's a picture of me like lounging on the bed in this historic house museum like <laughs> And so, you know, I think that further enhanced my interest in architectural history, interiors. Um, also taught me to, you know, ask <coughs> questions, um, you know, and, and sometimes the hard questions. Um, and continuing, you know, to do that kind of thing and, and explore uh, architecture, which in, in some ways you would think is very um, accessible or knowledge about architecture. Um, but here at, um, at UT, he was taking Dr. Cleary's class in um, uh, architecture in the age of revolution. And so as part of my term paper, or research projects like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll do research paper on how maybe um, the Haitian Revolution influenced American architecture. But because this had not been taught in a textbook in any kind of way, wasn't part of any formal learning, um, you know, and I'm from Louisiana, I had no idea about the massive influence of the Jean de Couleur Libre or the free people of color. And so this term paper that I wrote for the class um, ended up ultimately de developing into um, my dissertation in which I studied the antebellum influence of the Jean de Couleur Libre on the um, environment of um, antebellum New Orleans. Um, and starting this project have this massive spreadsheet where there are just scores of individuals and dozens of families who were influential in the building trades or either as property owners or commissioning buildings of various sorts, typically domestic uh, architecture during this time period and what I ultimately ended up doing was narrowing down the massive amount of information that I did find to two families, the Dolios and Souliers um, in New Orleans. Um, and of course New Orleans is um, after Charleston uh, one of the earliest um, National Register of Historic Places, um, historic districts. Um, but even in you know this early National Register nomination there's no mention of um, the Jean de Couleur Libre and their influence. There's a focus, you know, specifically on architecture, which you find um, and which is, um, I think, has been detrimental to the listing of properties on the National Register of Historic Places. Could, there wasn't even a um, category for ethnic her heritage until maybe the 80s. I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure because most of the oldest ones that I've looked at in the 70s 
don't have that category, so I'm not even sure when it came about. Maybe Leslie can help with that at the end. No, Leslie works for the THC, sorry, <laughs> the issue programs. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just that aspect, you know, and, and just a very obvious omission, um, you know, specifically here talking about African American heritage, but, you know, talking about any other ethnic groups uh, that have populated the United States um, has been very interesting. Um, and, you know, there are many conclusions that I made uh, and, you know, just sort of things that opened my eyes uh, that relevant to not only the Jean de Couleur Libre, but also the study of African American architectural history in general. Um, you know, and just this idea that essentially history belongs to the victors, to the people who have won and who are writing the history. And in the absence of people who are literate, who are professionally trained architects, um, you don't have those stories coming to the fore. Um, and the Jean de Couleur Libre really were architects in their own right. Um, and not only architects in the sense that they built things, but you know, architects and designers of the way of life for an entire community based on their contributions to the built environment. Um, and the map that you see here of not only the Vieux Carré, the French Quarter, but uh, most of the older parts of New Orleans really just illuminated uh, to me, the, the massive influence, not only as builders, but as property owners. And the dots that you see there are um, the properties that either members of either of those two families owned over the antebellum era. And it might have been for a short period of time for property speculation. They might have built on it or sold it and built something for somebody else on it. Um, but just that information, these were just two families. Um, and I the percentage right now is escaping me, but there's a significant amount of property, not only in the Vieux Carré, but in the um, suburbs in New Orleans of property that was owned by free people of color that you just don't know about. And you know, so just these kinds of things that are missing, but really uh, the Jean de Couleur Libre were, um, were architects, they were planners and creators. You know, if you think about that sort of old sense of the, the definition of architect, um, you know, of this, identity, this architectural identity that was really central not only to the story of the Jean de Couleur Libre in, in New Orleans, but to the struggle really that's inherent in American architectural history. Um, and really without their legacy, without their contributions, New Orleans as we know it would not exist. Um, but you know, growing up in Louisiana, I had no idea about you know, these individuals and their contributions. Um, and just today specifically taking some of these ideas about omission and the way that we look at landscape and see our, our environment and what's here um, and you know all of these these things that are that are missing in the very various layers um, of history that sometimes aren't apparent and I think it would be I thought it would be easiest today to kind of just distill that down to a discussion of um, of Austin and just kind of an overview of some of the properties um, with which I've come into contact over um, the course of my, my work here at um, UT. Um, and so in, the, um, in 1840, uh, that census counted 850 people living in Austin, which was, of course, a brand new city at that time, the capital of the um, brand new Republic of Texas. Um, and there were 145 <coughs> enslaved individuals, um, about more than a third of families in Austin at that time owned um, enslaved individuals. Um, or I'm sorry, at the, by the eve of the Civil War, a third of families in Austin um, owned slaves. Um, but only 6% of enslaved people lived in urban centers. Um, and Austin was an urban center even though Texas and Austin itself was really just the frontier um, at that time period. And so what you're looking at here is the 1840 map of um, Austin um, and its surrounding areas. Um, and you know, one of the things that I found in, in just kind of general research on Austin, um, on a particular property, um, the Neil Cochran House Museum that I'll talk about in just a moment, um, but also some um, work that I did writing in historic context for Waller Creek, um, and just you know Edwin Waller, and of course there's been um, of late discussions of individuals who were associated with the Confederacy or owned slaves, and how appropriate it is to um, commemorate those individuals through monuments or naming and things of that nature. Um, and so the Waller Creek Conservancy was interested in um, knowing a little bit more about Edwin Waller. And um, aside from the main historic context, um, they asked me to do a little bit additional research. And, you know, did Edwin Waller own slaves? And, you know, thinking to myself, okay, it's antebellum Texas. 
course he owned slaves and he owned property in Brazoria County so um yeah I'm pretty sure he owned slaves which he did um and what many people don't know is that you know because Austin had to be built very quickly sort of in his um journey here to Austin um he picked up enslaved individuals along the way and hired out slaves to help with the construction um, of Austin and their tax records and, um, and documents uh, from the, the Republic uh, that show that um, the slave owners, of course, were um, compensated for the labor of their slaves. And um, there are three actual names that we know, because usually we don't know names of people, but um, Mac, Adam, and Ned. Uh, and their owner was compensated for $450 for their labor. Um, there was a James Cox who um, loaned, if you will, several enslaved individuals for the construction of Austin. Um, another guy named Henry Jones, who was paid $254 for the work of um, enslaved individuals um, that he owned. Uh, and so we have this, you know, this sort of early background about Austin and you know who's building the city and, and, and who has a stake in the city and I think in you know thinking about architecture and, and building and as the city is growing and expanding specifically here you know and, and you know in general when we think about urban environments that question of who has a stake and why um, and, and who's given credit for um, their work um, but of course Abner Cook uh, becomes one of the preeminent uh, master builders and architects in, um, in early Austin very um, popular by the 1850s, by which time, you know, Austin has really become established, things are, are settled as the city is growing. And um, among the Greek Revival homes that he constructs, of course, there's the Governor's Mansion, um, the Pease, well, now the Pease Mansion, but it was, it was constructed for um, Shaw, like his name's escaping me right now, but became the home of um, Governor Elisha Marshall Peace, and um, it's called Woodlawn. Um, now, but he also constructed a residence that you see here for um, Samuel Haney, um, whose family had moved from Alabama to Texas in the 1810s. Um, he had moved um, initially to Washington County, and then as many um, a, an individual seeking sort of political influence um, and had government, various government positions, including serving as mayor of Austin twice, um, but in, the first time in the early 1850s. Um, and this house um, was located just southwest of the, um, the state capitol on Colorado. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, and he ultimately sold the house to Abner Cook, so it's known um, in the historic record as the Haney Cook House. Um, but this home, in addition to several other homes that were um, constructed by um, Abner Cook, were probably actually constructed by um, enslaved individuals because he did own several um, over the course of his career. Um, he also had a couple of brick kilns on Shoal Creek um, where through, at which he would have trained enslaved individuals and he also owned um, a sawmill out in Bastrop. And so having ready access to materials that enabled him to become a very preeminent um, and important builder in early um, Austin. Um, and so he constructed um, this one home, the Neil Cochran House, um, for what it's now called the Neil Cochran House, um, but on property that had formerly been owned by Haney and the highlighted areas are areas all over um, Austin that Haney had acquired um, when the city was founded and the star um, in the yellow area that other star isn't supposed to be there. Um, shows where the location of that house was. Um, but there are other areas in Austin and in, in this house um, I, I wanted to touch on and probably should have touched on first was um, constructed for um, members of the Hancock family and so it ultimately became known as the Moore Hancock Farmstead and it was built around um, 1849 for an Irishman named Martin Moore and his family um, and then um, John Hancock of you know Hancock Shopping Center fame and and all of that um, uh, acquired this property and um, later um, individuals who had been previously enslaved by Hancock and the Hancock family lived on this site. And so one of his former slaves, Orange, um, lived there with his family. Um, and I, I came upon this particular house quite by accident. Um, but the, the couple that lives there now is great and they like people to actually come and look at the house. Um, but it was fun 
um, hearing them talk about the house and sort of their discovery of, of it. It had been sort of covered up with other materials. You couldn't tell that essentially this was this early Texas dog run house um, initially, but they uncovered um, everything and, and were looking for more information about the or formerly enslaved individuals who might have lived in this house. And it wasn't until um, they were doing work in uh, what's now the kitchen of the house and uncovered some boards. Um, and there in a very light um, pencil, they saw the name Emma. And um, through additional research, um, because the, the wife is a, a historian, both the, the, the couple that lives in this house, they're both historians, um, did some work and um, they found um, in a slave narrative essentially, um, words of Emma, um, and she said, I don't, and I'm not reading it in the dialect that may or may not have been hers. Um, I don't remember the day when I was set free, but I do know that Pappy came over one day and got Mammy and her children and took them over to his cabin, this house, on Judge Hancock's place. So I reckon that was the day we were set free. Pappy worked for the judge now by the month, I believe. Um, and she was one of the earliest members of this family to become educated, to learn how to read and write. And then just having that connection and seeing the physical evidence in that home was amazing. And it's one of the few cases where we have words and actual physical evidence, not only in the house, but in you know like the material culture, essentially, of, um, of the residence itself. Um, in many other cases, we don't have that um, specific connection two individuals, and that's been some of the, the more recent research that um, I and the students in my um, African American Experience course embarked on last semester. And my slide's supposed to be moving, but I'm going to keep talking because my computer is like dying. There it is. Um, and so here we're looking at what was originally the home um, of Washington and Mary Hill. So they can, um, commissioned Abner Cook to um, build this home in the mid 1850s, they run out of money, um, overextended themselves and didn't sort of have the same political clout as many of Cook's clients did at this time. Um, and so they ended up having to sell the property before it was completed. So Abner Cook took some shortcuts and whatnot because they were running out of money. Um, this house was, um, again, uh, one of many buildings that was listed to the National Register of Historic Places under architecture for its association with Abner Cook and as an exemplary example of the Greek revival in Texas, and that's it. No mention of this outbuilding um, that you see here, which is referred to currently, but we're hoping to change that as the dependency, which would have been the slave quarters for um, this home. Uh, the ground floor, it wasn't a kitchen, there was a detached kitchen that was originally associated with the residence, but the ground floor would have been utilized as workspace and then living space for any individuals who um, inhabited this building on the second floor. Um, it likely preceded the actual house um, constructed by the enslaved individuals um, that Abner Cook utilized for labor, um, and they would have lived in here uh, while they were building the rest of the house. Um, but until really um, my, my class did the research on this building, there hasn't really been any significant amount of research, and it's something that the director, um, Rowena Dash, had been interested in pursuing for several years, um, and with that work, um, they're hoping to, um, in the very near future, embark on reinterpreting the space so that we know more about any individuals that might have worked on this site, lived on this site, um, after the house was, um, well, the hill sold the house, and um, Sw uh, Swisher, John Swisher and um, Swante Swenson, who are sort of among the important individuals in early Austin, own the property. Uh, they rented it out for various uses. It served as an army hospital um, during the Civil War. Um, we do know that the U.S. Army would have hired um, or in, uh, used enslaved labor while it was a hospital. It was also the first home to the blind asylum um, that was the, until the permanent home was constructed at what we know of as the Little Campus um, here at the corner of the frontage road basically in MLK. Um, that became the first permanent home of the blind asylum, but this was um, the house of this building, and we do know that they um, hired from various individuals in Austin, enslaved individuals, um, to work for the Blind Asylum, and so they would have inhabited this space and utilized it as well. Um, and so looking at 
uh, this particular building um, itself and the property and the people that would have lived in it. But it's also been interesting to me to um, think about the the um, Rowena and others at the um, the Neil Cochran House Museum. Later, it was owned by two white families, the Neils and the Cochrans, with um, associations in the late 19th um, century and early 20th century um, ties to the University of Texas who lived in the house. And so even as opposed to being named the Washington and Mary Hill House, this house comes down to us in the uh, historic record as the Neil Cochran House Museum. Hopefully we can get them to change that too. Um, but the um, Neil Cochran House Museum um, sort of boasts that this was, um, you know, is the only um, extant slave quarters building in Austin. Yes and no, um, is sort of the only one that's intact. But this home, which does have a historic marker, the um, Edward Clark House on East 11th Street, um, the building that you're looking at here was converted into a single family home um, in the most part during the 1940s and 1950s, but it is believed to have been what was, um, it would, would have been originally the slave quarters building on this property. Um, and again, it has several additions, so it's not recognizable as such. Um, but in thinking about the overall landscape of Austin, I bet most of us wouldn't have thought about, you know, or, or realized that we still had slave quarters here um, in Austin. Um, the Neil Cochran House Museum and uh, the slave quarters building there has been particularly interesting for me as well because of its um, proximity to one of the many freedmen's communities that was established here in Austin in the postbellum era. Um, and so in addition to thinking about urban slavery and how it might have been very different um, from other places, um, you know, and the fact that in, um, in the antebellum era, um, Austin, like many urban um, areas, was unique. Um, the situation or institution of slavery was quite different, of course, at, than at rural plantations because many um, enslaved individuals didn't actually live with their um, enslavers. Uh, during this time period, they might have lived in, um, you know, shacks nearby or in, in other areas, and um, it was not atypical, as I've mentioned, for people to hire out um, their work. And so they had um, a certain sort of freedom, if you will, um, in the manner in which their their time and their work was hired out to individuals. And some of these early enclaves of um, enslaved individuals later developed into freedmen's communities, and Austin had several, this map from the Austin Public Library shows not only freedmen communities that were established within the city limits at that time, but in fringe areas, in rural areas um, throughout the city. Um, and the dependency at the Neil Cochran House Museum, so you're seeing that at the, um, the circle at the lower left here, um, was very close to Wheatville, um, which was just north of 24th Street and um, one of the um, sort of main buildings, the most significant buildings in that um, neighborhood was a two-story home that was initially constructed by, um, not James Wheat, because James Wheat founded the neighborhood. His name's running away from me at the moment. Um, but he constructed this two-story home and lived in it for a short period of time, but the house is more well known for its association with Jacob Fontaine, who was um, a formerly enslaved individual uh, that became a very prominent Baptist um, minister in Austin, in Travis County, Hayes County, established several um, Baptist churches in, in the area and throughout Texas, and um, also established one of the first African-American newspapers west of the Mississippi, the Gold Dollar. And he and his family lived um, next door to this building and then at a later time in this actual building, and he ran his newspaper from um, this building. Um, and that's the circle that you see um, at the top. Uh, this building does still exist. Um, it was this, um, it is a city of Austin. Don't get me started. As an um, Austin landmark, I'm, I'm trying to behave. <laughs> um, and so um, yeah, I didn't include that image, uh, although I probably should have. Um, as the house is being literally surrounded by condominium um, construction. Um, of course, with uh, the proximity to the university and, and West Campus, um, as early as the 1950s, um, you know, there's, there's students living in the area, um, sorority and fraternity houses. Um, one of the first student condominiums went up in the early 70s um, in West Campus. 
um, this building has survived of one of its most recent incarnations was it is Friedman's, um, and it was a bar, and the owners tried to um, a barbecue place too, mm -hmm, yeah. to maintain um, ownership with the purchase of the surrounding property for this condominium construction, but ultimately they felt that it wasn't good for business. They wouldn't be able to um, to do that. And so, again, they're not supposed to mess up the building, but you can't see it in just the setting. And it it's just, not on the register? It makes me sad. No, it's, it's not, not listed to the National Register of Historic Places. There was a little bit of an impetus to try to get that done before this work, but um, you know, and again, this naming and this, this layering of history and, and really kind of covering up of history when the, the building was listed as a city of Austin landmark, um, it was called the Franzetti Building. In the 1920s, there were, um, as African-American families are moving into East Austin, um, across East Avenue, what becomes I-35, because of the, um, the Austin plan, uh, you have more um, Italian American families, and uh, there were there was one family that owned the building before the Frenzettis, but they had a store in the building, and so the the it became associated with that family because they owned it for several decades. Um, and so when it was listed as the City of Austin landmark, it was known as the Frenzetti Building. Um, but in 2018, with this impending uh, condominium construction on the way, they um, the changed the name formally to the Jacob Fontaine Gold Dollar Building. Um, and that's what we have, a name of a building that's been literally, again, kind of covered up in this case. So um, we also don't think about some of the early builders and kind of happened upon this guy quite by accident when Kenneth Haferteep wrote his um, seminal work on, um, on Abner Cook, and I pinged him for a quick question about one of his sources. He said, as you're doing this, you and your students look into this guy, uh, Thomas Hill. He's a name I came across and thought there might be an interesting connection because there aren't very many Hills living in Austin um, just before, just after the Civil War. And I came across the name of an African-American builder. Um, and he hadn't done much other research. And so I started digging and pulling out ancestry and doing my thing on family search and find a grave. And it just happened. Um, find the tombstone of one Thomas Hill um, and one single newspaper ad, which I think is pretty significant in the 1880s that this guy was important enough to have an ad in the newspaper saying that he was building um, some kind of commercial building, it seems, um, on West 4th Street. And then finding his tombstone in Oakwood Cemetery, um, just on the other side of the um, I-35 northbound frontage road and then seeing on it, you know, the, the symbols of the tools of his trade, um, the plumb bob, some kind of trowel and a brick or stone um, here. And so that was quite amazing, um, you know, in some of these stories um, and this knowledge. And then I was also informed that there are descendants of Thomas Hill who live here in Austin still. And so that's sort of part two of uh, some of this research that continues. Uh, but in addition to using and utilizing enslaved labor, um, Abner Cook is known before he came back to Austin in the 1850s for the work that he did um, as superintendent of the Huntsville Penitentiary, not only utilizing um, enslaved labor, but really establishing the convict labor system here in um, Texas as well. Um, there have been fantastic stories in the news of late about the discovery of um, grave sites associated with um, convict laborers and, um, in various parts of the state. Um, but convict labor, which is something not many people know, was utilized to construct the Texas State Capitol um, in its present iteration. Um, and we're looking at uh, the, the sort of, I guess, gathering or commemoration before they put the statue of the Goddess of Liberty um, on the top of it. But here, um, you know, on the bottom left, images of convict laborers as they're working uh, to construct this building. And there's actually, um, in Austin, uh, the Oatmanville Quarry um, in an area um, now known as Convict Hill. You know, people wondering, you know, why mm -hmm. is it called that? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's because that's where the convict laborers, the African Americans, went and dug up stone for the construction of the Capitol. And at the time, there were several um, sort of railroad spurs that would take the stones from these quarries to the site of the Capitol construction. Um, and so, uh, you know, Oatmanville, so this is the Oak Hill area. 
uh, that we're talking about here in Austin um, was no negotiated as a, a quarry site. Um, and one of the reasons why they think, well, not because they worked there, but there are at least eight individuals um, who died while quarrying limestone in the, the early 1880s um, for the construction of the Capitol building. Um, and there's also a, you know, this letter that exists uh, where Cook and others are talking about, um, and well, in this case it's the, um, the secretary of the penitentiary board about the use of um, convict labor for construction of Huntsville. Um, and so you have these stories, but in, a, in addition to uh, this, the, this, these you know, kind of really negative aspects, you know, there, there are the highlights, um, particularly in um, the development of Austin uh, that, that I think needs much more credit in, in aspects of the built environment that are still present in, um, in very interesting ways. Um, here we're looking at the cabin of Henry Madison Green, who um, was the first African-American alderman here in Austin. His house, that's probably mine, I think, <laughs> was located at the, um, the corner of um, the southeast corner of the frontage road and East 11th Street. Um, and what, is that 11? Is that what it's called, or East 11, a huge apartment complex? So that hill um, there, um, and so it, later became sort of <coughs> covered, again, um, this covering up of, um, by a later house, and so it was a single family home. Um, and when construction on uh, I-35 started happening, um, the owner of this house sort of discovered this cabin in the midst of the rest of this house. And so the cabin was moved to the site of uh, present day Rosewood Park, where you can see it now. Um, so it's been taken apart um, but it is there and it is present um, for us to learn more about not only construction of this log cabin building but of important individuals in Austin history um, and predating the University of Texas, I think, which are, are testaments to Austin and where two um, institutions which in the 1950s were merged at uh, what we know as Samuel Houston um, University. Um, and so here we're looking at Samuel Houston College, which was in that same, basically across the street from the, um, the green cabin um, in that property where there's now additional um, apartment um, or condominium um, construction happening. And so what you see here in the larger photo is um, Burroughs Hall, which was one of the landmarks of that campus, a view of the campus on the I-35 frontage road, and then of course a rendering of the apartments that are being constructed there. And then um, Tillotson Institute, um, and both of the ins institutions came to be before the University of Texas. Um, Tillotson Institute chartered in 1877 um, and actually opened in 1881 um, in East Austin. Um, and of course, that institution um, does survive today. Um, that's Burroughs Hall there. I meant to delete that one. Um, but in the development of, um, of Austin and, and the Freedmen's Communities, um, Robertson Hill area in, um, in East Austin was among the areas that was very important. Um, and here what we're looking at um, in the bottom image is the, um, what's called the Detrick Hamilton House. Um, the smaller house um, that's painted yellow is now owned by the city of Austin and has become part of the um, African American Cultural and Heritage Facility which opened in 2013. Um, again under city of Austin stewardship um, is a cultural resource center um, it's open to the community to rent and things of that nature, but, um, and they have um, changing exhibits in the Detrick Hamilton House, which was constructed around 1900. So an example of some one of the homes that would have um, been present in some of these freedmen's communities, very similar to the kinds of homes we saw in Clarksville, would probably would have been constructed in Wheatville um, as well, and in um, about. 2006, I think, um, there was an effort to, um, to uh, rehabilitate some of the homes in Robertson Hill. Um, that's what you're looking at at the top left there. Um, didn't quite work out as far as low income housing and there's whole drama behind that as usually there is, uh, particularly when talking about housing and low income housing. Um, but some of these buildings were preserved in some state um, so that they're visible in that um, aspect of the landscape is um, still present. Um, another uh, site of contention uh, 
in Austin's history of late as it relates to African-American history um, has been Rosewood Courts, which was built in 1939 um, atop a former location that um, had served as a, a site for the celebration of Juneteenth. Um, and so this was called, um, it was one of the earliest emancipation parks here in Austin. Um, and so it was part of the parade grounds and the gathering place for Juneteenth celebrations. Um, Rosewood Courts was one of three complexes. They were segregated, one for African Americans, one for Mexican Americans, one for um, whites that was constructed in Austin. Um, Rosewood Courts has been, um, you know, there's this controversy as to its listing in the National Register um, that has been recent, but it was um, the oldest uh, U.S. Housing Authority uh, public housing in the United States and the first built for mm. African Americans. Um, part and parcel of policies, um, you know, developed by various individuals, um, including LBJ during this time period, um, you know, and just its expression of modern architecture and modern architecture that was considered appropriate for public housing during this time period. Um, so very significant in lots of different ways, um, even though the struggle to sort of um, have that that significance highlighted um, is retained, even though you have these you know these stories and these relationships that are quite um, in your face during um, from this time period, um, and just moving sort of quickly along to wrap up, um, you know many stories about you know of course segregation in Austin after the 1928 Austin Plan, where most African Americans are relegated to the east side of what is now I-35, um, which was formerly East Avenue. Um, and we do have several sites here in Austin that were listed in the Negro Green Book. I'm sure you guys all know the movie, um, even though they don't really talk about the Green Book um, in this <laughs> movie. Um, you know, I, just, I was so excited to go see it, but then when the brouhaha started happening, I was just like, you know what, I'm just not going to do it because then I'll be like moaning and groaning in the movie theater and my husband and I'll be embarrassed and you know all that kind of thing. Um, but here we're looking at the Victory Grill which was one of about maybe a dozen sites that um, throughout the Jim Crow era, um, so from the 1930s through the 1960s that were listed um, in the Negro um, Green Books, uh, the Negro Motorist Green Book and several others. There, this wasn't the only um, sort of race specific um, directory, if you will, that was established uh, to aid African Americans as they traveled because, of course, um, in some towns you couldn't even be caught in those towns after dark. Um, there wasn't a place to stay. You had to be careful where you pump gas. You couldn't eat in certain places. And so um, considering all of these things um, moving towards the modern era um, and ending here for me, which, which is also a springboard for work that I'm currently um, doing, um, you know, the work that John Chase, who of course um, really established his profession in Houston upon graduating from the University of Texas, but the first licensed African-American architect to practice in Texas, one of the co-founders of the um, National Association of Minority Architects, um, who grew up in Maryland, uh, attended Hampton, Hampton Institute um, served in uh, World War One, and then uh, actually worked for a construction company, which was African American owned, the Lot Construction Company, and important um, in the construction of lots of housing for middle class families here in Austin in the 1940s. Um, and so he was um, a staff architect for the Lot Construction Company. And then after the Heman Sweat case broke and had been advised by the Dean of the School of Architecture at that time to sort of bide his time, um, and then to be able to enter uh, the School of Architecture here at the University of Texas, which he ultimately did. So we're looking at um, his registration. Um, and although the Heman Sweat case, and Heman Sweat is well known, um, he didn't actually, Sweat didn't actually enroll in UT until the fall. But um, John Chase and one other gentleman enrolled in the summer, which made them the first um, to enroll in graduate school at the University of Texas. And so um, this one photographer from the Statesman um, you know, contact and was like, look, this is a big deal. And so Sweat shows up in his suit and tie and mm -hmm. had his pictures taken um, for his um, enrollment. Um, and again, as we're really starting to, not, well, not starting to acknowledge, but um, I think really coming to the crux of uh, um, acknowledgement of 
um, Chase's importance in the history of the university, in architectural history, in American architectural history, in Texas. Um, again, you know, we know the significance of these individuals, these people, but um, David Chapel, and it makes it harder because it's a privately owned religious building. Um, the church wants to sell this building and its property um, to a developer um, that's not widely known at this time, um, but it is sort of, you know, has been coming out into the open a little bit um, more. So it'll be interesting to see what happens because this is basically uh, sort of the piece de resistance of um, what enabled Chase to become a, a, a practicing modern architect and really set the springboard for his career. Um, his thesis was about um, progressive modern architecture for African-American churches and he would take his thesis around, you know, not able to get a job as an American architect, um, African-American architect, he would take his thesis around to churches and be like, hey, I can build this for you and talk to the congregation, talk to the ministers. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see where that happens as I am embarking on um, writing a book, a uh, biography on John S. Chase and his career, which um, will encapsulate, I think, in very interesting ways some of these stories about African-American architectural history and help to um, introduce that struggle in these stories as they relate to American architecture and, and utilization, I think, of unique sources in their absence from the um, American architectural canon. Um, so and maybe save this building. Uh, that would be fantastic. So I'm, I'm writing very fr frantically, mm -hmm. or starting to, um, especially um, it, as you know, I kind of promised Miss Juicy Chase his, his widow um, because she's in her 90s. So. The yes. house the street. Yep. The um, the Thompson house is a couple of blocks up in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and um, that's the Phillips house, right across the street. Mm -hmm. Yep. So thank you so much.